Is it offensive tackle or bust for the Cincinnati Bengals in the first round? Let's break it down. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. Today, we dive into some draft stock and strategy talk around offensive tackles, defensive tackles, and some New Jersey numbers on the Locked On Bengals podcast, a daily podcast on your favorite football team. We're on the Locked On Podcast Network on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcasts. So if you're new, you can subscribe. You can become an everyday or not miss an episode leading into the draft or afterward. Make us your first listen. We appreciate all of you who already do those things. And James, today, we're going to answer the question, is it first round tackle or bust? Can the Bengals afford to pass on one of those true first round graded tackle prospects that might be available to them? And of course, this assumes that one is available to them. And there's a conversation about who is competing for that 18th overall pick in the draft, because there's a chance that all of the true first round graded tackles are gone. There's a chance that the first round graded players at other positions the Bengals might draft could be selected as well. And that could make the decision for them. But if the decision isn't made for them, let's try to answer the question of is a first round tackle or bust. It's first round tackle or bust unless, and there's a qualifier there, unless someone unforeseen is available. And I think that the Bengals, they're prepared if Byron Murphy's there, they're prepared if Johnny Newton's there, and we can talk more about defensive tackle coming up. But I think most of these offensive tackles will have the edge when it comes to the battle of the trenches at pick 18. And the reason is because, and, and we've done this in our mocks, there's a lot of paths to eight tackles, eight offensive tackles going in the first round, and then an early run in, in between picks 33 and 40, 33 and 45. And so if you're the Bengals, yeah, you can say, all right, well, let's take a defensive tackle. Or heck, I'm on team take Brock Bowers. But it is a risk because you don't know who's going to be there at 49. And I do think that the Bengals, in a perfect world, would leave the first two rounds with their future starting tackle, potentially a starting tackle this season, but certainly their future starting tackle and someone that can serve as a swing tackle this year. So it's it's tough because I, I don't want to say it's this position or bust, but barring something unforeseen, there are only a few scenarios, I think, where you pass on the offensive tackle for insert player X that people have talked about. Yeah, and the tricky thing about it is where those tackle runs will happen. They could happen, like I said, before the Bengals pick. All of the five or so, maybe six if you count uh, Troy Fatanu as a, as a tackle, they could all be picked before the Bengals get on the clock. I saw a mock draft where even with six quarterbacks picked before the Bengals pick at 18, which I think is a little outlandish, the best player available is still a defensive tackle. Because all the other because all the other picks were wide receivers and offensive tackles, essentially. Like it's likely that we see a couple of defensive players picked before the Bengals pick at 18. It's likely we see an edge rusher and a corner come off the board, but it's going to be a stacked, heavy, early offensive draft between the quarterbacks, wide receivers, and tackles. And that's where you look at it and you could say, well. Joe Walt's obviously going to be picked. Maybe you, you can assume that Olu Fashanu is going to be picked. J.C. Latham could be picked. Fuaga could be picked. And then it's, is Mims truly a first-round grade for us? In, in, or is that where you consider Mims versus one of these defensive tackles, assuming that Brock Bowers is also picked, which I think is a pretty safe assumption, or Mims against some other defensive players? And, and how is that in the scenarios? Because you look forward to the second round, and unless you think Kingsley Suamatia is going to be there or you really like Patrick Paul, the, the gap in tackles, just, just to take Dane Brugler's big board on in the beast, which 
he published as we record this today on on Wednesday. The gap in tackles between OT7, which is Suamatia, at 40, and OT8 is an entire round almost. That's pick 59. So there's no like perfect, here's a guy in the 45 to 50 range who's a tackle who you really like that you think is going to be there in the second round. And that's why it feels like there might be pressure to pick a tackle in the first round. Yeah. And there's almost there's a scenario where let's say it's Brock Bowers or Quinyon Mitchell or or one of the defensive tackles, which we'll talk about, like I said, and you take them in round one. There's a scenario where round two of the offensive tackles aren't even close to the BPA. And and you almost wait till 80. And now you're definitely talking about a developmental guy that's a non-starter. You're not expecting him to compete with Trent Brown. That doesn't mean he won't, but you're not expecting him to compete with Trent Brown. And, and that's where it, it gets tough. Where it's like, all right, are, are you sure you don't want to marry us, Mims? Because I probably do. Or J.C. Latham or Fuaga or insert the, the scenario because one of those guys is probably there. And, and so that's why I think the Bengals are – looking at these offensive tackles so closely because they know they see the drop off. They don't expect to be picking in the top 20 again next year. And so it's hard anyways, but the gaps are very, very real. That doesn't mean there aren't scenarios where they land a Patrick Paul or a Blake Fisher or a insert, whatever day two offensive tackle, maybe at pick 80 and, and feel good about it because there could be value at 80, it, it might not be there at 49, but there might be value at 80 at offensive tackle. But do you want to bank on that and roll the dice and risk it? That That's the interesting part. Now, if the Bengals are willing, and we can talk about this between now and the draft, to move up and be aggressive in round two, well, then you're more, more likely to, to roll the dice. At the same time, you could do that at other positions too, not just the offensive tackle spot. And that's where it gets really interesting because to me, the big six, offensive tackle-wise, assuming the Bengals view them as the big six, those are the guys that you should target because the Kingsley, Sue, Matias, uh, even Morgan uh, out of Arizona, was it Arizona, Arizona State? He's Arizona. Arizona. He, he's he's going to be long gone before pick 49. Yeah. And so even if you really like him at tackle, you, you think he can come in and be that guy, they're going to be gone. And, and so that's something I'm sure the Bengals are well aware of. That's the issue with waiting for value at tackle waiting and hoping that you get a guy in the second round or in the third round tackles get picked earlier most of the time than people think they should tackles get pushed up the nfl is desperate and thirsty for tackles and this year there are five or six depending on troy fatanu's position on your draft board true first round graded tackles in this class and then there's guys like Tyler Guyton and Jordan Morgan at the end of the first round who are going to be in like the first, second round bucket. Dan Brugler, by the way, sees uh, Jordan Morgan as a guard on his board. Interesting note there. But when you have an opportunity at 18... Tommy listed there too as, guard. as a guard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you have an opportunity to pick a true first round graded tackle at 18, even if the Bengals are picking top 20 in the next few years, because something has gone wrong and they don't make the playoffs. Your your likelihood of having available to you a true first round graded tackle is low in most years, which is why there's so much focus on this tackle class and why there are scenarios where all those tackles could be picked before the Bengals are on the clock. It, it's it's a feasible outcome where well, all those guys are gone. We're picking a defensive tackle now. We're picking a corner now where you're probably still getting good value and a good player, but you're missing out on this relatively rare, maybe not even relatively, just straight up rare opportunity to get a true first round tackle and talent on your team. And, and that's why we've talked about it so much. That's why even when we talk about, you know, the, the very highly rated and exciting prospect in Brock Bowers, I always come back to, man, but it's hard to pass on an offensive tackle here. It's always hard every time we go through the scenarios, even if it is a guy like Bowers. Yeah, and that's that's the balance. Is how many guys are like that? Are any of these defensive tackles like that? Are the corners like that? Is Bowers like that for the Bengals? That's probably one of these edge players like that for the Bengals. I mean, that's that probably covers everything. I guess I could throw Brian Thomas in there, but it's 
it, there aren't many scenarios, right? Because there's like six tackles. All those positions I just named, it's like six players or so that could potentially be in that mix. Let's talk about the defensive tackle class and Johnny Newton, because you love him. Bengals fans love him. Well, the Bengals love him. Does the NFL love him? Well, we'll get to that coming up next. This episode of Locked On Bengals is sponsored by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA, in the NHL. Baseball is in full swing. We got Ellie De La Cruz doing crazy things in a Reds uniform, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. And if you're not into those other sports because you're listening to a football podcast, they've got NFL draft props as well over at FanDuel. They've got futures. They've got the Bengals' odds to win the Super Bowl next year. They've got the Bengals as the fifth most likely team by the odds to draft Brock Bowers. They're plus 1,000, though. The Jets heavily favored to draft Brock Bowers at this point at plus 200. The Colts plus 340. So I guess FanDuel thinks Brock Bowers will be gone. But right now you can get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed at FanDuel. That's $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a bet win or lose but on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks to those draft props on an app that's safe secure and easy to use check it out today at fanduel.com slash locked on to make your first bet an automatic win or check out the app fanduel america's number one sports book let's get to these defensive tackles and start things with johnny newton because i we've talked about this the NFL and the vibes coming out of the combine were like, yeah, Byron Murphy, certainly day one defensive tackle. Johnny Newton is going to be available. Heck, I remember Greg Cosell telling Dan Hort, like, oh, yeah, he'll be there at 18. Like, it, just straight up. He'll be there at 18 if you want him. And the Johnny Newton, and he still has a pro day coming up. I believe it's on April 16th. But the Johnny Newton stock watch here doesn't feel like he's a real candidate for pick 18 or a real candidate to be a top 20 selection through most people that, that are analyzing this daily. Now, there are some that still think he's, and rightfully so, the top defensive tackle on the board. I like him a lot. You, you'll be hearing about him when we get to our uh, mock draft. He's certainly in the mix there. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of wild, Jake, because Johnny Newton in some mocks falling to round two. That would be surprising to a lot of people, and yet there's at least a scenario where that happens. Yeah, Johnny Newton on the PFF board, extremely high. We talked about this in a mock well, what Where were we talking about this? Was it yesterday? Was it two days ago? We were talking about the disparity in Newton's placement on a number of big boards, where for PFF, I think he's eighth. He's, he's DT1 for Nate Tice, much lower. For Dane Brugler, he comes in at 28th. In the beast, he comes in with a first slash second round grade in the beast. Mel Kuyper just did a mock draft on ESPN.com where th there are a couple of interesting things there that we could talk about. Roger Rosengarten keeps getting into the first round for, for Mel Kuyper. Kingsley Suamatia made it all the way to 64. But Johnny Newton was picked in the 40s of that mock draft. And if you're telling me that you have to use 18 on Byron Murphy, but you could get Johnny Newton in the 40s, I'm not taking Byron Murphy at 18 and I'm going to be aggressive and trade up and go get Johnny Newton in the forties. But obviously you, you can't enter the draft expecting that possibility it would have to be like a contingency plan, but can I give you a scenario? Yeah. And it has to do with Johnny Newton. Let's say they take whatever offensive tackle at 18, mm -hmm. but whatever one you want, Amarius Mims, JC Latham, maybe one of the better ones, uh, Olu Fashanu. And then that day two lull of what, what how, how many hours is it like 16 hours yeah johnny newton's still there the panthers are sitting there at 33 would you would jake lisco offer 49 and 97 for 33 to get johnny newton no doubt but i don't think the panthers take that trade i i, okay. I think you would have to give up 80 or, or or even additional day three picks, perhaps. Okay. And, and, and then I think it gets a little bit harder. But if it, yeah, I mean, I, what I would try to do is I would try to package 49 and 97 and, and move up somewhere. I will be watching closely the top of that second round and say, is there somewhere I can get into the 30s and, and go up? 49 again? 
97, you have a six, you have a set, you know, you could throw those in if you wanted to, you could throw your fifth oh, yeah. in if you don't For care sure. about that. Cause you have, a, it, and then and maybe it's not 33, maybe it's 35 or whatever the case is, but that's where it gets crazy where you could hit two, you could hit a grand slam, put it that way. I mean, if you have a Marius Mims and Johnny Newton and one pick in round three, still you feel pretty darn good. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I would be looking ag- aggressively to trade up for Johnny Newton at the top of day two, if he's there. Yeah, maybe it's not pick thirty three, and and the price could be too high. Like maybe you can only get up ten picks. Maybe you can only get to thirty nine with pick ninety seven. Maybe you do have to give up eighty. But even if you give up eighty, if you still have pick ninety seven, you can still get a third round player, and you come out of the top of the draft with two guys that are going to be near the top of our board potentially it, I, I don't know about mims but say say you get a tackle any of the tackles that have true first round grades and you come out with newton as well that's going to be a start to the draft that really gets things going and and, and is going to be deserving of high marks from from me in three years from now like if they did that let's just say mims and newton there's a semi-realistic scenario where it's ot1 and dt1 Could like be. when you revisit mm-hmm. Like, I'm not saying that it's definitely going to happen, especially for Mims or Newton for that matter, but it could. And so it's one of those best case fun scenarios where it's like, yeah, if you get rid of one of those picks, even if it is 80, but you get that kind of quality, it's probably worth it. You know, it's probably worth it. Yeah. And and that's one of the scenarios where if Mel Kuyper is right and Dane Brugler is right and teams are really worried about his frame you know, the, the 75 inch wingspan or whatever it is, which is only two inches smaller than Byron Murphy. But for some reason, we're talking a lot more about Newton size than Murphy size. And I still don't really get it. And, and maybe it's just because he hasn't done the rest of the testing, but man, that would be a fun scenario for the Cincinnati Bengals. And, and Trevor Sikama on, on the NFL stock exchange podcast, they had Brett Coleman and, and did a, a crossover event mock draft for the Bengals traded up to pick Fuaga and then later traded back up with T Higgins to get Brock Bowers. That would also be fun uh, talking about fun scenarios, but uh, th- there's some fun trade up possibilities depending on who falls where, which do you prefer Fuaga Bowers or, or what Mims Newton? Yeah. in in obviously you have T versus trading T. In one of those yeah. scenarios. I, I think probably Men's Newton because you also have your your A third round pick there. But man, is that close? Like Fuaga Bowers, you don't have T, but you have you still have your second round pick, so you can go get another receiver if you want to. Uh, man, flip a coin. Those are both great. I assume yeah. you're on the Fuaga Bowers side. Fuaga Bowers, no, I, as of and today, a second I'm round not, pick and a second I'm round not, pick. Well, that's it. Is what, what's that second rounder? That because that's the tiebreaker, right? Where it, yeah. you know, if it's if you're if you're if you're giving Troy me a little Franklin, you're, you're a little Troy Franklin, Brandon, yeah. Uh, yeah, Brock Bowers, and uh, yeah, we uh, we're cooking there with Fuaga as well. So that offense, good luck keeping up. We're putting up forty every week, not thirty. Remember James's mark from Locked On Bengals thirty a week. Well, now that's a four. By the way, as, did you see? Did, did you see Joe Burrow doing pull ups? By the way, yeah. With rings, baby. He's got full grip. That's hard. He, he, he's got that Jake Lisko grip. It is hard. That is hard. hard. Stabilizing hard. and doing all that. Hard exercise. Um, I, I had, oh yeah, 40 points per game while scoring in the NFL continues to decline. Last notes on the defensive tackles really quick. Would be Just, 50 in 2020 or in 2021. Would uh, be 50 a game. Yeah. Uh, Tavondre Declining Sweat. To 40. Just, just some notes from Dane Brugler's Beast Draft Guide. Some some reasons that we saw him so low on some big boards coming out here in, in the beast, seen as a party animal, class clown, as an underclassman by NFL scouts who questioned his commitment to becoming to becoming the best player he could be, had a professional mentality in 2023, but that DWI really cast some doubt there. Also, some concerns about keeping his weight under control, all listed in the weaknesses section there. So Tavondre Sweat coming out with a fourth round grade in the beast to start. And in case you were wondering why he was always available in the third round, well, at this point, it's looking like if if Brugler is plugged in with the NFL, which he is, he very well could be. 
Coming up next, James, some jersey numbers. Ooh. Are they good? We'll discuss coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Because passion, drive, and patience is the formula for winning championships. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from roof racks, LED headlights, superchargers, exhaust kits, whatever you're into from speed, power, style, eBay Motors has you covered. Maybe it's just routine maintenance like spark plugs, air filters. eBay Motors has it with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive today at ebaymotors.com. That's ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Jersey numbers. Everybody's favorite topic. And are Definitely they good? Did, did, your, did anyone your favorite topic? Did any of the Bengals' new free agent acquisitions doom themselves by picking numbers destined to fail, or did they set themselves up for success, James? What do you think? Well, thirty-one is the one a lot of people are going to talk about. I think, <laughs> yeah, with Zach Moss, I think that's the one that stands out because you got Sheldon Rankins, ninety-eight, makes sense. He's worn ninety-eight. Mike Gesicki, eighty-eight, makes sense. Trent Brown, seventy-seven. Geno Stone, twenty-two. All of those we knew. Von Bell, 24. Shocker. But Zach Moss, rocking the 31. Rocking the Uncle Mike Thomas. It's interesting. It's interesting. Maybe he makes 31. He, this is the start of a, a ring of honor tenure for, for Zach Moss, and he puts up huge numbers. But 31 at running back, that's the one that certainly stands out for sure. Icky Woods wore 31 in 1988. I'm looking at the list of Bengals to wear 31 here. There, there you go. He, he wore 30. Th apparently 31 for one season, according really? to Pro Football Reference. Jeremy Johnson from 2003 to 2007 also wore 31. Safety Darren Smith in 2016, 2017 wore 31. Thomas Rawls, Michael Thomas, as you just mentioned, Michael Thomas. Uh, Roy Williams in his brief stint. Oh yeah, with yep. the Bengals, also wore thirty one. Lee Davis. It had to be thirty back Jake. in the day. Because when Icky was when Icky was on SI, he he wore thirty. He wore thirty one for one season. His uh, his first season in nineteen eighty eight, according to Pro Football Reference, he was thirty one, and then he was thirty in eighty nine through ninety one. It, it's so weird, Ben. That on SI he was the the cover. Anyways, all right. Uh, Pro football reference could be wrong. It it's, might be. It's wrong. certainly possible. It feels wrong. I'm sure there will be people who were alive in 1988 who will correct us. I was born in 1988. I mean, I he's dancing with Mickey year. Mouse, so they had to be good. He's dancing with Mickey Mouse here in number 30. I didn't know we would talk about Mickey Mouse today, but here we are. But <laughs> here but, we are. But I agree with you. Like his rookie card has 31. Oh, there you go. We'll have to get to the bottom of it. Point is, 31 is not. But the then it also has 30. What is going on? 31. Maybe he changed mid-season. Maybe they were yeah. less weird about jersey numbers back ma then. Yeah, that, that could be it. Because in the Super Bowl, he I've watched the Super Bowl. He wore 30. 31. Yeah. He, he's 30 in the Super Bowl. Not a decorated number in Cincinnati Bengals history. Let's just well, say Well, it's going to be. It's going to be. It's going to be. Did you see Zach Moss squad? Well, we talked about it yesterday. Yeah. Zach Moss, man. Leg day. Was that 495? 495. I that, cannot that's like that Arby's number. two for one. 495. Get you out of there under five dollars. The the amount of weight that NFL players can squat. People don't know. It's crazy. It's wild. 409. It, especially running backs, because they're lower. Yeah. Like offensive linemen are stronger, obviously, but they're so much higher. They're taller. Longer so levers. But man, these these running backs are just freaks. Zach Moss. And, and, and he did that easy. He could do much more than that. Oh, yeah. That's a working set right there. Maybe even a warm-up set. Who knows? Zach Moss, 31. Geno Stone, 22. Mike Gusecki, 88. Trent Brown, 77. Sheldon Rankins, 98. The rest of these are perfect. Stock. Great yeah. numbers. You got some symmetry. 77, 88, 22. You got a former Texan defensive tackle wearing 98. All sorts of congruency, symmetry in these numbers. Nothing Troy to Franklin's going to wear number three. 
He called me and told me he's going to wear number three. It's going to be Bengals. Great. Yeah, they have three available, right? Oh, yeah. I guess they have they a lot for, of numbers available right now. They do for Troy. <laughs> Let's see. People are going to get sick of that, but hey, whatever. People, they won't be people, sick when he's scoring touchdowns. People know, James, you're only interested in wide receivers in the second round. That's not true. I would love to have Troy Franklin in round That's three. what they know. It's just Every, not gonna everybody knows, James. <laughs> What's I'm actually out on the in, in school. Was he number three at Oregon? Is that why you say that? No. Oh. It's just it's a it's the fun number, right? It's the number that Zach Moss wasn't 31 in Indy. That's what's interesting. Yeah, where's 31 come from? You'll have to ask Zach Moss. Why 31, Zach? Well, he wore chance. 20, he wore 21 in Indy, and Mike Hilton had that. So mm. it might be that simple. Yeah. Could be. You want to close the show on a on a fun T Higgins praising his agent note, or do you want to get and, out of here? And he wore T. And he well, you, you have to do it now. But he wore twenty with Buffalo, and he wore two at Utah. But Evan McPherson is number two. Twenty. Who's 20? It's DJ Turner. Yep, DJ Turner. So there you go. So he had to switch up numbers. He had no choice. Could have bought it from. You, you got on T Higgins. Paul Daner tweeted earlier on Wednesday that T. Higgins and Antoine Winfield are the only two remaining franchise tagged or transition tagged players who do not have long-term deals. He said, it's quite easy to understand Higgins' frustration through this lens. A Bengals fan who I'm going to not say the name on the podcast, although this is very easy to find, said that T. has a poop emoji agent. If T. Higgins had Jalen Hurts' agent, T. Higgins would have a long-term deal. T replied, nah, he the best. T Higgins likes his agent. And I think that's an interesting note. Doesn't really mean I, anything. But it's I didn't see that. Yeah, it's his agent. Like, it would be like if 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 someone said to you, I would hope you would defend me if it was like, man, James is the bleeping worst. He's not that bad. I talk to him every day. And, and I don't represent you. You don't represent me. But we represent each other on the pod. Yeah. Agents are on a whole nother level. Yeah. So I'm not shocked that T has his agents back, but I didn't see that. That's that's a good one. That that happened, I guess, this morning. Yeah. Wednesday morning. Um, players generally like their agents. If 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 the player feels the need to step in and, and say, get the deal done at any cost, they will do so. It happens rarely. It happened with TJ Watt, notably. And and notoriously in Pittsburgh, but it should not surprise anyone that T. Higgins likes his agent, who is doing everything he can to get him as much money as possible. So, yeah, not sure. really news here, but uh, there there, I, there are some out there I know that, and and the the sentiment here is is not rare, the distaste for David Mulligetta and, and blaming Mulligetta for the deal not getting done, but. Uh, should surprise no one that T. Higgins picked his agent for a reason and is sticking with his agent for a reason. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And and so there you go. They're in solidarity. There's a reason the trade request came out. I think T's going to be a Bengal this year, and their camp knows it at the same time. They have to stick together if they're going to to go through this and try to get their deal their way, which sometimes is uncomfortable. Yeah. So we got some good jersey numbers. Uh, a funny little T Higgins reply, finding himself tagged in a tweet about his agent. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. Until next time, thanks for listening. Hootay, and have a good one.